This is Identity at the Center. If it has anything to do with IAM, this is the go-to podcast. Now your hosts, Jim McDonald and Jeff Stedman. Welcome to the Identity at the Center podcast. This is Jim McDonald. I'll be podcasting alone with our guest today. Uh, Jeff and I have both been displaced by Hurricane Helene. Uh, I've been a little bit less displaced than Jeff. I'm currently in South Dakota where we have free air conditioning. It's only 65 degrees and, and lovely, and we have internet and electricity. Jeff is back home. He's safe and sound. He didn't suffer any real property damage, uh, but he's still without electricity. So he's highly inconvenienced and not able to make it today. Hopefully this episode goes out on time, but you'll have to excuse us if we miss our normal every Monday um, publication. So today we have a very special guest, but before I get into introducing our guest, I wanted to go over a couple of things with conference codes that we've you know set up specially for our listeners and our viewers on YouTube. Uh, so the first one is a conference that begins, I think, next week, based on when this episode will drop. Um, so if you're a last-minute registrant for the South Point Navigate Conference, it's October 21st through 24th, and it's in Orlando, Florida. Uh, we have the code IDAC. That gets you a $400 discount. So if you're last-minute going, use that code, save some money. Two other codes that we have. So first is Sempris's Hybrid Identity Protection Conference, or the HIP Conference for short. Uh, that's November 13th through 14th in New Orleans, very cool city. Uh, and it's a very cool agenda that they have laid out. We have the, the code IDACPOD, I-D-A-C-P-O-D, that gets you 20% off. And this is the first announcement of this. We have a code for the Gardner IAM Summit. Uh, the Gardner IAM Summit is in December. It's in Grapevine, Texas, and you'll save three hundred and seventy-five dollars on your registration with our exclusive code, which is IDAC three seven five. So, with all of that, we're saving you lots of money. Uh, we love it if you use the codes because it gets recognition from the conferences that you're actually listening to the podcast, and we definitely appreciate that. Um, I wanted to introduce our guest today, Eve Mailer. Eve has been on the show several times before. She's the president and founder of Ven Factory. Hey, Eve. Hey, it's great to be here, Jim. I think this is the fifth and a half time. <laughs> it very well may be. I think I might have. Uh, yeah, we have uh, definitely five. And then you helped us out with the episode on um, uh, what's the difference between I am and digital identi identity, yeah, right? And, that was and now one. I want to yep. change that question. I want to add, what are the differences between I am digital identity and identity security? So in other words, through the curveball of what is identity security and how's that different? Oh, that's a great one. Uh, yeah. You, 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 uh, yeah. That's, are you asking <laughs> me? <laughs> I, I, I mean, why don't we come back to that at the end if we have time? Because we have such Sounds a full good. agenda of things I wanted to talk to you about. And I, you know, going all the way back, you were, I think, one of our first big name identity guests on the podcast back in episode 48. I recommend for folks to go back if you want to hear like how rough the podcast was when we were just starting out five years ago. June of 2020, episode 48, Eve is on. You went over your identity background story. You've been on several episodes since 116, 151, 202, and 262. So since it's been four years since you gave us your full identity origin story, how did you get into identity? And is this something you picked or did it pick you? I think it kind of picked me. I mean, it was a little bit accidental. I had joined Sun Microsystems, and I was in the XML Technology Center. And that was a big thing then. And web services started to be a bigger thing. And a colleague and I determined, hey, you know, we web services security is going to be really important. We had a partner that came to Sun folks to say, hey, we have a spec that we did to kind of outsource authentication. And we 
want to standardize it. Can you help us with that? And there was a sort of a competing vendor that had their own spec. I brokered bringing both of those specs to Oasis. That became the group that produced SAML because I was kind of like the Switzerland of people involved because I wasn't really in the space, which we didn't think of it as identity so much then. It was kind of like security and directory. I was an XML person, so they chose me as the first chair. And I found myself with a new livelihood somehow after that. Yeah, and I mean, bringing things forward as standards, I can't imagine the industry without SAML. I mean, it would look totally different think back to those early days of identity and, you know, it, the, the way of the walk was really um, proprietary uh, web filters that filtered out access to applications and saw if you had a cookie or not, and then forced you through an authentication. Everybody did it a little bit differently, but it was very proprietary. Yeah. It's, I think the cross-domain part of single sign-on was, you know, obviously the, the innovation there. And it took some doing, right? Because if you're trying to securely fling identity information across the internet, you got to think harder about it. So that's, that's what we worked on. And it seemed like we solved a problem that had a good, I guess, product market fit. Uh, it's still used today. It's not, you know, much built upon in addition to the original stuff. But, you know, it's, it's well used. I don't think I like to say nothing deployed ever goes away. So I think SAML's not going to go away. And so it's a nice, it's a nice feeling to know that it's been useful. Well, I think the other thing about SAML, at least I was a practitioner when it came out and I'll be honest with you, you know, I wasn't the big picture thinker, I'm not saying I am now, but I, you know, I look more at the limitations and I kind of thought to myself, well, but how's this going to solve all these complex problems? What I didn't realize was that companies and, and application teams would change their applications to work with the standard and solve part of the problems that were like the limitations in some other way. You know, I looked at it like, okay, we've become dependent on all these pri pri proprietary methods for doing authorization and things like that, or we need to have working X, Y, Z, you know, our special way. And I didn't think the engineering community would adopt SAML in the way it did. And I was wrong. It's one of those tough bets you have to make if you're working on something really new. And I've worked on a bunch of, you know, I worked on XML, which was kind of a, we carved away parts of SGML that didn't look like XML. And that's how we made XML. So it was an easier proposition to adopt it. Um, but in the case of SAML, it was really just de novo. And the bet that you're making is that multiple parties in an ecosystem will change their behavior. And it's by no means assured, but we, you know, we had some of the big vendors at the table. When we started working on SAML 2, IBM came to the table, which was a big tell. Microsoft started sort of, you know, signing up for things. And I was at Sun at the time that Microsoft and Sun had that uh, the big settlement and worked on kind of mutual WS Fed SAML interoperability, which is kind of a big deal. So you wouldn't think those little things would make a big difference, but they really do. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah for sure. And I, I think the big lesson that I got from that in my career is that as these new, you know, collaborations are happening to come up with a standard is they may at the time seem like, okay, this doesn't solve the full problem that I have. That may be by design and it Sam may not. Did that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. SAML 1, we actually, you know, we debated how many use cases to take on and just doing IDP first, single sign-on, it seems like not sufficient. What it's sufficient for is a lot of workforce use cases, like logging into your benefits provider and things like that from your employee login. So it tended to have a bit of a workforce bent versus a SIAM bent, though it's not necessarily specific to that, but That's it didn't right. bite off more than it could chew at first. And it turned out that we won the right to keep going with SAML 2 after that. Yeah, no, that's great. And a great point on the Siam Ben, because that's kind of where I was coming from, was looking at it as like these real complex applications and uh, et cetera. So, Eve, I reached out to you recently because you posted something that was like clickbait for me. Um, <laughs> the title of a blog that you wrote was called Personhood, the Killer Credential. And I wanted to hear more. I wanted to learn more. I did read your blog. Uh, I'm not sure if everyone did, but we'll put it in the show notes. But Eve, 
could you kind of summarize what this is all about? Yeah. And, you know, that title had a question mark on the end of it. And that's, it's, you know, sort of part and parcel of my inquiry about, okay, if we're going to have verifiable credentials, what is going to make that ecosystem successful? And really, I think of it as each different kind of credential representing a different product that could have its own ecosystem. Because for folks who've been following the, the decentralized identity story, you've got, you know, you've got a lot of players in the picture. They're just talking about standards, the need for all parties to change their behavior. So in this ecosystemic uh, economic view of the verifiable credentials proposition, you need to get an issuer who's willing to play. You need to get a verifier who's willing to play. And hopefully most particularly, you get a holder of the credential, you know, we're thinking mostly in terms of humans, willing to play and more than willing, a killer credential is like a killer app. You know, it just takes off and it's kind of viral and it makes the platform that it's sitting on worthwhile. And so the last couple of years, I've given a couple of talks at Cooper Call events doing this kind of analysis around, well, what's the killer credential? You know, what could it be? And I looked at a bunch of different verifiable credentials as candidate products that could go viral. And the personhood one, actually, we were, I was calling it at the time, like, is it a person? Is a person? Or alternatively, not a bot. But that turned out to have some properties that I thought could make it possibly the most successful of the bunch. And there's a lot of others, you know, age, you know, your, or, or like age assurance or age estimation, that kind of thing. There's some other more fanciful ones. So it looked like it had some good prospects. But then recently, there was this research paper that came out about personhood credentials written by a whole bunch of identity and privacy and AI people who are, you know, some of them are famous, some of them are known to us. And I was really interested in doing research on that and like, okay, let's deepen this analysis. Is it working? And so my blog post was basically just a, a meta analysis of this PHC paper to go, do I believe what it's saying? Where do I think there are parts that are squishy? You know, I'd love for there to be success. How can we get to success? So one of the topics that is getting a lot of attention right now is identity verification. How much of the personhood credential is about identity verification? I, I mean, identity verification in my mind is mostly about, are you the same person in the real world that you are representing online? Absolutely. So that, that that's a big part of it, but you're also bringing up the the AI element to this, which yes. is almost like CAPTCHA version 1000 or something like that. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Let's hope CAPTCHA doesn't get that far. Let's hope it gets better and better and doesn't go in that direction. But, you know, part of the reason why this PHC research paper was written was the, the threat that we're facing from AI with deep fakes, synthetic identities and the rest of it. And, you know, if you're in a 100% remote, 100% digital interaction. Like here we are talking now, and I just assumed you were really Jim, and I could tell from various cues that there's a human sort of operating the, whatever, <laughs> the meat puppet, the stalking to me. <laughs> um, <laughs> like, wanna, it is connected to identity verification in a sense, because a lot, this is my take, a lot of the candidate issuers of verifiable credentials in the world who might be in a position to say, that is not a deep fake. That is really Jim sitting across there from me. They're also in a position to know exactly who you are and to map you to the real world, right? To do real IDB, to do real verification, real proofing. And the idea with this PHC notion is you don't have to reveal as much as that. You can reveal it's a real person sitting in front of you right now, and that's all you really need to know. And there's privacy preservation characteristics as well as Maybe in social networks where people like the ability to be, you know, relatively anonymous, to know that they're dealing with people just like them and not bots. And this is where, you know, I brought up Reddit in my post. I'm a big Redditor and I like, you know, knowing some bots declare themselves in Reddit, but other bots obviously don't and we don't like them, right? So, so personhood as a, as a piece of information, as an attribute that you can convey, it's kind of a subset of true identity verification. And I've learned through my kind of further research talking to people out there, there's, there's some vendors who are also providing kind of a space in between just it's a person, not a bot, 
and all the way to verification, which is, yes, they connect to a real world person, but we're not going to tell you who. Yeah, but I, I think that is one level of, of testing that's important is just, okay, it's a real person. Now, do our other authentication mechanisms work? Right. So I, it's, you know, the whole notion of this like zero knowledge proofs and selective disclosure that you get into with, with verifiable credentials comes into play with this. Oh, well, it's a person. That's all you need to know. Yeah. Well, you know, and, and maybe I was thinking about this with the limitations of what I think the technology is today, but I started thinking about the NIST, you know, levels of assurance framework and the idea that, okay, maybe on Reddit. You don't need this. I hate to, yeah. to say that, you know, <laughs> but like Reddit access is not like going into your bank account or filing your taxes or changing the bank that your hopefully refund is going to go to. Right. <laughs> so have, am I being limited by the technology when they think that, or is that part of this, you know, for the foreseeable future? I think I, mean, I think we have opportunities to go outside the, you know, low assurances. I don't know. I'm going to say just a password. That seems like not even sufficient anymore for, for you know, LOA1, or we used to call LOA1, you know, authentication yeah, assurance I level agree. one. I agree. But for a long time, I think there's been a parallel discussion to the NIST levels along the lines of, um, look, you, you just want to know they're not a dog. You want to know they're the same dog as yesterday. I wrote about this in my blog years and years ago. And, you know, there was there was an effort that Justin Richer started called Vectors of Trust, which enabled there to be kind of multiple dimensions. Ultimately, ultimately, NIST 800-63 went in that direction as well, so that you have identity assurance level, you have authentication assurance level, you have federation assurance level. People talk about other dimensions. And then they you can imagine them starting to float, although quite often we still imagine them in lockstep. But if you imagine that you could have strong authentication without receiving information that gives you a strong identity assurance, like or, or that you can get identity assurance that's anonymized, you know, that's the kind of thing that credential world seems to make more possible. And so, you know, I was interested to look at that proposition and see if it holds up. Yeah, I think that's a good point there with um, 800-63 having the, you know, A, B, and C, which is what is it, federation, authentication, and identity. So you could be at like a level two identity or level three authentication, which is essentially unfishable credentials. It kind of feels to me like the personhood kind of at least conceptually combines identity and authentication. Or it, it do you still of, see it, them it's differently? It's in the cracks. No, it's in the cracks. Like, you know, a good blues note. <laughs> it's It's sort of playing both sides. One of the things that I think people don't think about it quite often, and I didn't see this recognition in the paper so much. Verifiable credentials are a delivery mechanism for, I'm going to call them attributes, right? They're not the thing that does the checking about whether you're a person or does the checking about true deep identity verification. So you still need to do that work. And those, you know, let's say a bank or a government agency still has to have methods of doing the checking, doing the authentication checking that's necessary, doing the binding to the device that we happen to be, you know, all the devices we're talking through and, and doing maybe verification to the nth degree before releasing just a little teeny bit of that information as a personhood credential. So, you know, I, I think the work doesn't go away and the threat from AI doesn't go away. There's folks who are working on that and, you know, doing a pretty good job in, in that arms race. The credentials ecosystem, it doesn't really have much to say, as far as I can see, about the doing of that work. Yeah. You know, I, I want to talk about the AI component because I really feel like this is kind of the driving force behind a lot of this. Um, and I think we spent a good bit of time talking about it from the a person or potentially a, a bot accessing a resource. Mm -hmm. I think the other side of it is AI is required to do that detection. I don't know. I guess here's what I'm kind of thinking is that smaller firms are not going to be able to keep up and writing their own AI engines that would keep up with 
an open AI or what Microsoft or Google are doing with AI. And that could be a, a major influence around what the industry looks like 10, 20 years from now. I mean, I kind of feel like, um, I, or I shouldn't even say I feel like, I guess my question is, is how do you see this playing out in terms of, okay, you've got these major AI organizations building AI. Now you have companies that build authentication technology. Do, do they kind of get forced out of the picture or do they somehow adopt these major AI engines, let's just call it an engine, and leverage that technology so they can keep pace with all the big players? Here's what I think. I hope they don't get sort of forced out. There's a couple of options. One option is, you know, the actual mobile devices that we use are doing, I believe they're, they're an under-analyzed resource for how we can get pure personhood, not necessarily with all the KYC type of stuff, because they're bristling with sensors. They have accelerometers. You walk around with your phone. My watch is telling me, you know, how fast I ran or whatever. So those are elements of, you know, not a bot kind of entity moving about in the world. And so I kind of feel like that that level of access that a small company might have to information that gets rid of overt bot activity might be available through those platforms, the OS, okay. the device, the browser. Now, on the other hand, there's a lot of vendors who are, you know, there's big ones and small ones who are pushing ahead on this kind of improvement of liveness detection as an example of where you need to improve. And a lot of where those vendors play is with the financial institutions and the government agencies who kind of are responsible for knowing who you are in the real world for various reasons. And so one of the things I, I've anticipated for a while and I've seen as we've seen the, the growth of password lists and then sort of true pass keys is the places where those are getting adopted tends to be like retailers who can rely on payment rails where that's helping to have that happen for them. And you can be quite a small retailer and work with Shopify, for example. And, right. you know, they, they can give you a pass key. And so I think there's kind of an ecosystem that can be strengthened in terms of its resilience to the AI threats around deepfakes, synthetic identities and everything. It also kind of helps make the experience of being a smaller player quite efficient and scalable. The other maybe downside from a, from a decentralized identity perspective is it's centralizing things. You know, everything tends to roll, roll towards the center, not just identity of the center, but, you know, all, all business tends to sort of roll towards these brokers, these exchanges, these things in the middle. And um, we have to see what the result of that will be. Because, I mean, first of all, the OS device and browser makers are kind of, you know, that's big tech right there, and it's quite centralized as well. I kind of feel like the the level of competition in the market is what keeps the price as low as it is. And I'm sure I might get some hate mail over this. Like, are you kidding me? This is not inexpensive. Um, but look at what's happened with like ticket brokers. You can't go to a concert for under a hundred bucks, let's just say. And it's because of the limitation of space. If you have to run your retail operation through a Shopify, if you have only a couple of players in the identity space, I only mm -hmm. see the price going up. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Yeah, consolidation has some some costs to it. Um, the nice thing is that there's a whole bunch of innovation among some of those smaller players, and so there's a kind of cycling that that's going on. You know, I've talked to a bunch of folks who are doing some interesting stuff in you know biometric technology and detecting that and uh, various kinds of uh, verification techniques. It's it's improving. Okay. Well, this is, a, this is a fantastic discussion topic. I'm going to put your blog posts in the show notes and people can reach out to you, keep the discussion going. If you decide to move it on to Reddit, uh, <laughs> move the discussion on to Reddit, that's fine as well. Um, you recently did another, um, well, I shouldn't say recently. This is one of the, one of the ones you did a while ago, right? Going back, talking about consent is dead. 
And I think you did a blog post on it that we'll link to in the uh, show notes as well. Can, can we kind of start with that consent is dead shtick, if you will? What is that all about? There's a lot kind of underneath of that. Yeah. I mean, so I, I had the great opportunity to appear at EIC this year in Berlin, and I gave a, a keynote talk on Consent is Dead because they asked me, you know, months prior for a title, and I picked the most provocative thing I could think of. And then I had to, you know, do the work, do the research, decide, you know, what I really think and, just, and find out just how bad it is, how bad it is out there for like, if you are, you know, clicking, I agree, and so on. We all have this suspicion that that's kind of meaningless. And based on some research that I found through Internet Safety Labs, where, uh, disclosure, I'm a board member, there's just some great work that they uh, did themselves and found elsewhere showing just how identifiable we all are online and how much our wishes are ignored online. And just, just how bad it is, even in Europe, even in the EU. Like, you know, you'd think that GDPR was going to save everybody, and it hasn't really. And so... I got told, you know, from somebody who was appreciative of the talk, they're like, yeah, but it was depressing. <laughs> and like, you know, I'm trying to figure out, well, how, how can we make things better? And where I went with it was, and I did a, I did a four blog post series, because I basically wanted to make sure that that kind of thinking was accessible to folks who aren't Cooping or Cole subscribers necessarily. Um, and I'm happy to share the deck for for people who want that as well, if they if they just write into me. And I think you go to EIC or uh, Cooper and Cole's website and watch the video of it. You, you sign have up for to be uh, you have to have attended or be a subscriber or something like that. But but you know I wanted to just share the thinking, and I wanted to share particularly a window into this world that has the word identity in it that I think a lot of I am people have no idea exists, and that's the world of identity resolution which is about that kind of heuristic checking using big data lakes without a direct relationship with the person, you know, the end user at the end of all this. Um, and that's the stuff that fuels the customer data platforms and the data brokers and the data monetization that, you know, big enterprises are doing everywhere. And they're hiring these folks to identify you from the tracks that you leave from your exhaust data, rather than going straight to, will you please, you know, register for a login with us? So it's kind of that whole world that starts before or without, you know, the cookie that says you have a session or that relationship that you might forge, you know, directly with a company. And so, you know, what I found when, when I spoke to this audience at EIC, you know, I asked the audience, you know, who's ever heard of identity resolution? And that like hundreds of people, two people raised their hands. Hmm. So I feel like it's called identity. It's, it has something to do with identity. We need to be aware of it so that if we want to mitigate those as threats, we'll be better prepared to do so. Feels like it has a lot to do with privacy as well. But, you know, I, I kind of feel like the first time this, this really irritates me. And this, like you said, someone said it's depressing. To me, it's very irritating. Every website you go to, it's like, accept our cookies or beat it. <laughs> and it's like, okay, well, I want to, obviously I want to go to the website. Otherwise I wouldn't be here. So I accept the cookies. Now I'm accepting what to be tracked. And then it's yeah. sign up for an account either, even if it's go through and use your Google account. Like, hey, we're going to have access to all this information. Normal, but I do think that it at least puts you in the power because it's simplified and kind of like you can say, all right, well, they're going to have access to my email address and my birthday. And I might not like that, but at least I know I can make that decision. What really bothers me is when you go through a whole process and you say, by continuing, you agree to our policies. And usually our terms and conditions aren't policies. And once in a while, I'll get like the crazy idea, I'm actually going to click on it. And then I see it's, you know, an hour's worth of reading on a bunch of stuff that there's no check boxes. Like, I agree to this. I don't agree to that. It's, yeah, you can't change it. I mean, it's it's a contract of adhesion, as the lawyer lawyers would say, right? It's you don't have much choice about it, and thus it's it's not really, you know, the lawyers would call it defective consent if they weren't all sort of defending GDPR and doing all the other work that they're doing, which I'm sure is important work. Um, many of my best friends are lawyers, I have to say, but but you know, these are the the factors. Sometimes the regulatory environment makes businesses go down this track of doing things as they do. Like the whole sort of cookie consent regime 
which is pretty meaningless. By the way, some of them will track you even if you say don't. Sure. These things do not result in, they might result in compliance, but we know they don't result in customer trust, privacy, particularly security. So, you know, there, we can ask ourselves after six years of GDPR enforcement, actually, you know, what's, what's changed, what's gotten better. And that's kind of why I, why I wrote all this stuff and why I've been sort of talking with everybody about it going, all right, how do we do better then? What would, what would be the first thing you do? And it's, you know, what I came to the conclusion of it, it's rooting out those beliefs that were sort of limiting us and starting to get real about what it is we believe about what's possible. Yeah. You know, I kind of, I feel like I came to a pessimistic conclusion about GDPR, which is that it's basically a system to find organizations that are breached, which I guess there's something behind that. And, and maybe I'm just being overly negative And I, again, I'll get, uh, roasted online for this but it's kind of like that's what seems to really drive people is they don't want to get fined so that makes sense and i don't think that the companies that are always breached are just the ones that are asleep at the wheel i think there are others that are asleep at the wheel who don't get breached and i think sometimes organizations that get breached are doing a good job um it's I think your comment about, you know, what GDPR is for is it's incisive because you're observing what they actually do and going, well, I guess that's their purpose. And that was, that was one of the shticks that I used in the talk. There's, there's a famous saying by this guy, Stafford Beer, who was known as the first cybernetician. And he says, the purpose of a system is what it does. He also said, there's no point in saying that the purpose of a system is something that it consistently fails to do. So... You know, you can look at the results of a system and, and I think in fairness say, well, that's what it seems to be there for. Right, right. So um, what were you, when you look at the consent is dead kind of shtick, um, what was the recommendation that came out of that? In the end of the, at the end of the day, what were you saying? It's, you mentioned like looking at data leaks and um so is the idea that you can infer a level of consent based on some kind of like meta profile that you've created? You can infer who is in front of you, even if they haven't shared that with you, or even if they've only shared a very tiny amount of data, like tiny in the sense of verifiable credentials, you know, sprinkling on top of the relationship. So I am, I'm actually working on a white paper, so I could just sort of hand people, you know, it doesn't have to be a four-part blog post. You could just sort of read the whole thing at your leisure, print it out, whatever. Um, and, and I'm going to be making some recommendations so that people could take action, so that, you know, identitarians can take action most particularly. Um, and I think one of the things is, is to discover, to uncover just how deep the data monetization system goes in your business because that's going to determine the purpose of your system. If a company is making money off of personal data, whether it's directly through, you know, interacting with somebody or whether it's going and buying the opportunity to target ads or buying data that re-identifies them in, you know, quite awkward ways, like find out how strong that ecosystem is in your company so that you can start to make decisions about what your privacy and consent and even part of your security stances can even allow you to be. So that, that's like one thing that I'm thinking of, you know, that's the kind of conversation you need to have internally because those are stakeholders who, you know, they live in marketing, they live in maybe a chief digital officer land. And that's why uh, we were talking earlier about your, your mention of Gigya and Jan Rain recently, you know, as last for the past, from the past for me. Because those folks specialized in that kind of consumer-facing market, marketing-enhancing identity system. And, you know, those things have existed. They've, they were closely aligned with social sign-in. But they really go beyond that these days, and it's quite sophisticated as a kind of MarTech, ad tech ecosystem. Yeah, it's really, but I still think it's the, like, the chief marketing officer who's behind making the investment in a digital transformation or customer identity and access management, which I think Gig and Genrain were on the right track. I just feel like what happened was when they were about to kind of like achieve that 
big picture, they both got acquired. But it doesn't feel like that's the that the that hole that they left in the market was completely filled as a void by other players in the space. They, they didn't take as much of a marketing focus. They said what you really needed was security. Do you agree with that? I mean, you were right in the in the heat hmm. of it. So if I'm 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 sitting here in the yeah. uh, peanut gallery watching. Reflecting on it, actually, you're making me think that the IAM industry has actually pulled back from the brink a little bit in engaging with the marketing colleagues who are so keen to get that information in, in a SIAM context, right? One of the downsides of having pulled back a little bit, I think, just thinking about it right now, is um, we have maybe over rotated on how privacy sensitive we are and how privacy sensitive we're being. And it's led to a very robust conversation and a lot of solutionizing around some of the decentralized identity solutions in the name of privacy and user control and consent. And yet, one of the things I point to in various places in the series is the work that's done by Sam Smith. So Dr. Sam Smith, he's the creator of Cary the key event receipt infrastructure, I think, where he, his most recent research is, honestly, it's damning. It's damning against the notion that selective disclosure helps the situation. And so if that's the case, I'd be advising people, don't spend a lot of money on selective disclosure technologies, specifically, if your aim is to keep people from being re-identified because, well, don't trouble yourself. They're very easily re-identifiable, particularly with all the new AI in the picture. So, you know, maybe there's cost savings there and you can be honest with your with your users. Yeah, I, I, I kind of feel like from my very entry into this industry, there's always a line of this is identity data and this over here is not identity data. And sure, there was some gray area, but the gray area was pretty thin. So in other words, you know, um, your credentials, those are definitely identity data. Your transactions are definitely not identity data. The state and city that you live in, I don't know. Some people treat those as identity data in certain contexts. Others are just shipping addresses. And so when you start to look at big identity projects, usually the first thing you need to solve is like, how do you deal with identity data? How do you kind of like, who is Eve? Like it's not just her yeah. transactions, but that becomes very important. If like Eve goes on and all of a sudden is buying some things that are like out of her price range and <laughs> are things that she doesn't buy anymore, we can certainly in infer from a security context, this might not be Eve. You know, th this is, you're getting at something really important. You know, for a long time, I was saying that Identity is small data. You know, there was this big movement towards big data, and now we just talk about data lakes and whatever warehouses. Um, but the information in your profile, anyway, is it's relatively small in amount. Um, it's relatively well bounded. But all the business systems that have other information about you, I mean, there's a lot of value in integrating IAM systems so that those other business systems are, you know, they're all connected to the right person for not just upsell, but also fraud mitigation, you know, opportunities. And a lot of the, you know, the GDPR rights that I would for time go around talking about and how you could implement them with, an, with a good SIAM system, that's valuable to do. But I think we're not going down the right road if we think of the identity data, the profile data, you know, just the account data all by itself as everything there is in the universe. There's a huge other universe out there. And that's where I think getting to understand how that larger graph is being used, it's critical for uh, prosecuting your aims of privacy and trust and even security as an identity practitioner. I want to transition because I think this is a great transition point for authorization, kind of like what can be done with authorization? What can be done with data? to infer authorization. But before we transition there, one other thought that I had was, we were talking about a lot about artificial intelligence, AI, not Allen Iverson, artificial intelligence. <laughs> so, um, so here's 
the balance that I've been kind of struggling with or thinking is like the real question that's going to have to be solved with AI is like there are certain IM approaches that are, let's take the paper and pencil process. Jim requested access for Eve on such and such a date. Somebody else approved it, right? There's like all these things. You could pass a piece of paper around and people sign it. If we all worked in the same small office and then you put it in a filing cabinet and then somebody could go back later and pull that piece of paper out and look at it, right? That's what an IAM system is. And then also, Eve went to a website. She typed in Eve at XMLgirl.com and she put in her password, which is password123. It was accepted. You told everybody. <laughs> I told the world. All right. So now all, you're, you're in trouble now. Um, your AOL account is going to be hacked. Um, the, the, but, okay, that was accepted. And we put that in the filing cabinet. Now Eve goes and does what she's going to do. Oh, she bought something. We put that in the filing cabinet. But there are very specific actions. Now we have risk scores, which are being created. And I think that's still something the human brain can compute. It's like these factors, these 15 factors go into a risk score. So and we can maybe look at the piece of paper that tells us how she scored with this. Okay, she was logging in from North Korea and she was, you know, logging in with a headless browser. So we denied the access. So when we're in court someday and... Why couldn't she transfer the money she needed to transfer at that time? We say, we got this piece of paper because, you know, our policy stops that. But now my concern is that we get into this AI world and Eve is permitted or denied access. That we made the wrong decision and we go to court and we say, well, I don't know. Software just decided <laughs> not to let her in or let her in or whatever. And, and my concern is like, we don't really... If we don't know how the AI made the decision, then we're, we're, we're getting away from that paper and pencil, which I'm not saying is the right way, but it kind of feels like it's the tradition behind identity access management and technology, just kind of automating those things. And this does connect to authorization, so we'll be sure to do that next. But, you know, the signals have become more diffuse. I actually had, I was talking to somebody who was saying that COVID, the pandemic where people were no longer moved about the planet the way they normally do, messed up those signals a lot and made them a lot more uncertain. We, we like determinism. So the, something that looks like a you know, library book with a record and you go look up the workflow for approval, if it were on paper, that's very deterministic and you know who did everything. But going to that more heuristic world where you're taking these signals and deriving decisions that might have had a kind of automated component to them. I mean, one of the things that I think is a great idea is trying to work with explainable AI so that you it functions more as a recommendation engine and can explain itself. You know, just like when you go to buy something and, you know, Amazon says, because you looked at this, we're recommending this. Right. You can get a sense of, you know, because you access that, we're actually recommending you get an entitlement to that other thing. That would be a nice consequence if it were right, you know. So we're, we're in we're in land of many more signals, many more fine-grained signals, many more uncertain signals. And we're in this world where decision-making is taking a new turn, you know, the authorization decision-making. We've got new tools, but they are, but they're finer-grained themselves. So, you know, we need to be able to explain ourselves when it, when it comes to an auditor's question, for example. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's, auditor and some of these things could be court cases or forensics of hey someone just stole millions of dollars from an account um why you know maybe we can trace what happened but can we trace why it happened why mm -hmm. was the account given access well the ai approved the uh the access approved the level of entitlement um now can we explain why that that was some kind of predictable event? Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think we can go back and forth on that, but I do think that ultimately that's where we're going to end up is that it can't be a, a complete black box. Um, 
I did want to talk about the AuthZen working group. Maybe you can give us an update on that. Yeah, um, I'm, I think this is hopefully going to air uh, around the time of Authenticate, and there will be an AuthZen presence at Authenticate with some interop activity. There is a first implementer's draft of the AuthZen 1.0 spec out. There's a, a 1.1 floating around that has kind of an extension to the API. What AuthZen does is it's it's kind of a very modern take on stuff that we expected ExactMul to do um, a long time ago with PDP that can answer questions coming from a PEP, so a policy decision point, policy enforcement point. And so that's kind of the starting point for all this. The the one dot one at addition is to allow for asking the box carring the the requests and the responses. That's really cool. I mean, so I'm going to ask you a question about authorization that I'm getting a lot these days because authorization has become such a hot topic and it seems like um, uh, PBAC and to the lesser extent, but let's say PBAC is blistering hot, ABAC is something people are very interested in and the one that nobody wants to talk about anymore, but is still the most widely used, as far as I can tell, are back. I've actually had some of my clients ask me, like, you're, you're telling us that we need to do our back. And isn't that kind of going out of style? <laughs> or oh, yeah. not just going out of style, but is it becoming irrelevant? So in other words, we put all these years of investment into our back. Are we going to then have to just switch it out for PBAC? I mean, I don't see most of these as actually mutually exclusive. Like if you state your policies, I still can't get a clear answer on like, you know, policy is data, policy is code, anything written down, you know, in digital form can be managed as code if you want to. Um, so policies are not antithetical to roles. Roles are not antithetical to attributes. Since Gartner IAM happens to be taking place quite near to where I live, I'm, I'm thinking about having an authorization aficionado gathering. Um, and I've been talking about barbecue-based access control. So <laughs> you'd asked about IDAC back, and I say, why not? Yeah. But I, yeah, you don't want something to become perceived as no longer operative. It really is operative. And I think that role-based access control really is operative. We've learned a lot about how to make it a little bit more efficient. We don't want to lose those gains. At the same time, we know that it kind of has limitations at a certain point. And, you know, as soon as you could probably just do a, a kind of an evaluation of like how many roles you have. And if you have roles for more than about, you know, 70% of your positions divided, however they are, you're going to start reaching the end of its efficiency for what you want to do. And you have to start looking for additional approaches. You didn't mention Reback, which is the, the even newer hotness. That's relationship, of course. So I think that these are all, these can all play in a space where people are really trying to solve problems of making their authorization more externalized and more of a shared service than it ever was before. We had a, a show where we talked about this before and Someone, someone, asked, I think Jeff asked, or I asked que Jeff the question, what's your favorite back? And he said, baby back ribs. Back. <laughs> so that goes with your, your barbecue back. But I am in favor. Let me, let me give you my quick rundown of all the backs. I, I know less about reback, but what it, I have an idea in my head of what I think it should mean or what it does mean. Um, Okay, so our back I think is really two different concepts, but it's they're both using what is considered at least by the organization as identity data, and it's not authentication time, authorization time, enforce. These are groupings that are going to drive provisioning. So the first is a member of something, and therefore I get certain authorizations or entitlements given to me. So that's kind of like the birthright roles. And then the other benefit in our back or the second area is 
the roles that are, I, I'll call them business roles. So they're groupings of access patterns that make sense for me based on the job that I do. Um, but they would be assigned to me and kind of, let's call it ad hoc. In other words, they're not being driven automatically. A manager is going to say, Jim does this job and somebody else is going to approve it. I'm going to get a bundle of entitlements. But the, the driver there is that it's business friendly language, grouping multiple entitlements, which may or may not be business friendly, but the grouping of those should enable me to do some job function. So, but I think that the big thing with our back is, is not enforced at the time of authentication. It's a, it's a provisioning role. In my book, a back is authorization time or authentication time applied. In other words, Jim is in this department. When I, if Jim logs in, it checks. I'm in the, I have that attribute. I get that access. In my mind, that's what AVAC is because if AVAC was provisioning time, that's really the first, that's birthright RBAC. And, and at the whole point of AVAC really is to get finer grained and more dynamic, right? So that speaks runtime versus admin time. And I kind of like that dividing line actually because. If you need to know a role at runtime, it's expressed as an attribute, and then you grab it as an attribute. So it's actually kind of clean. I think I like it. I think that's clean. And so, so the third area, and I may be missing the boat on this, but PBAC. To me, this the difference between a PBAC with ABAC or RBAC is it can work with data that's outside of identity data. So in other words, here, let me give this use case example. I have a combined account value of over $50,000. So I'm a high net worth client, and therefore I have access to the high net worth client portal. That is not an identity data. Nowhere in my identity profile or in, in some kind of you know LDAP <laughs> does it say what my account mm -hmm. balances are, right? Those might be in a data lake, but they're probably operational data within some kind of banking system. Yep. The PBAC would have the policy of 50K or more, give access. So it checks the account balance table. It's over 50K, or maybe it hits some API or something like that, right? And it says, yes, you're in. So to me, that's where the policy back differs because it's using non non-identity data. Does that make sense? It does. I mean, you know, I, there's obviously policy that is um, much more simplistic than that and only relies on data that you have lying around in your LDAP. But I think that being able to mix in data from other sources and most particularly environmental conditions, like my example is always phase of the moon, like maybe there's more fraud in a, at a full moon. And knowing that is you're just going to grab it from, you know, I don't know, the, the, the weather channel or something. So, so yeah, I, mean, I, I would buy that. I think that they all can be used in concert in a well-thought-out access control system. And then, then you have another overlay where you ask questions like, how close to um, least privilege do we want to get? How do we measure that? And are we going for zero standing privilege? You know, the new slogan where, for my money, Making decisions about giving access should be easier to grant, easier to do, make, because the consequences are lower. They're for smaller amounts of access, and you're okay if they expire, the person loses access soon enough, and they won't mind having to ask again because the process is so simple. So that, that's like a whole other level of sophistication that would require probably all of the above. And, you know, including that, that relationship-based access control where you're deriving policies from real-world relationships that could have other stuff, other important decision-making derived from them as well, not just authorization. Yeah, that's real interesting. I, I started to think about Reback, and they don't know much about it, but it came, came to my mind that in the CIM scenario, especially at B2B, it's like Jim works for... RSM Corporation, 
our company has a relationship with RSM. We have certain contract codes and X, Y, and Z. And then based on Jim's relationship with that parent organization, he inherits certain entitlements. I mean, I know that's a, a very specific example, but to me, that relationship requirement has been around for a long time. And and the more dynamic you need to get about relationships, like I once worked with a customer, back one, that managed you know, thermostats, smart thermostats, in all the rooms of an office building that had many tenants. So you've got like the energy company, and you've got you know the thermostat making company, and you've got the tenant, and you've got the building owner, and if a tenant is in one month and out the next, and they want access to the thermostats or need to pay the energy bill for their portion or whatever, like suddenly you've got this kind of API ecosystem that is extremely fine grained and the relationships are changing fast. So wherever those relationships kind of have a high velocity of change, that's just a great use case for that model. I'm not going to bring up this, this topic completely because Jeff's not here and he and I don't agree on it. And you're probably going to ask, people are probably going to ask themselves, like you've been in identity for 20 years and you're asking what is an identity but to me you bring up that thermostat topic and to me it's like it brings the question of okay are those thermostats identity identities maybe they have a credential maybe they have a certificate they log in with i think no they are not identities i think they are devices or they are nodes i don't think they're identities i think the, the person that they belong to is the identity, but my goodness, that is one of that. <laughs> my favorite topics. And yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I'll Maybe we can save on... it for another time. <laughs> yeah. We have to have Jeff here. We have to prepare yeah. because we, you know, that would be potentially, if we're talking about World War Three happening again, that could be it. <laughs> I will tell you though, that there's this whole non-human identity conversation and it's just zoomed up really fast. NHI. The first case of yes. non-human identity that, you know, I dealt with was, I mean, in addition to things like OAuth clients and, yes, services and people talk about workload identity, but it, IoT never seems to come up. And it's weird to me because, you know, devices need unique identifiers and they do need to have, you know, controllers who would be human at some point when you go back for far enough in the chain. So are right, they identities? Enough, exactly. I don't know. Oh, yeah, no, no, you're great. You're bringing up exact. Okay. So that's exactly where I am. And then uh, I think the 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 further or one of the other points you brought up is like that's become hot, and I'm like, okay, but that's been an issue as long as there've been there's been an internet and as long as there's been devices, which is forever, and we don't talk about OT with IM very much, and those are topics that I want to explore the podcasts and you know. Maybe they'll have their day. It'll be like the, the whole tulip bulb fever thing from whatever it was, the 14th century. It'll exactly, have its day. It'll yeah. suddenly be very hot. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I was disappointed to hear you're not going to be at Authenticate. Um, so we'll, we're going to be doing some stuff with the podcast at Authenticate. Um, we're going to be part of the keynote on Monday. We're going to get a recording of that and drop it as an episode sometime this year. So mm -hmm. everybody gets to enjoy it. Um, but it made me think also we're going to San Diego. I'm trying not to, to gloat about that too much. I'm excited <laughs> about the, you know, being out there. I love the weather and the resort that the conference is at is just super nice. Um, have you, so let, this is kind of the lighter note question, Eve, is what's the, the last, um, personal trip that you've taken and where'd you go? Yeah, the last one was a kind of a long weekend, Labor Day weekend in Vegas. Mm. So some people really hate Vegas and they go there under duress. I think I think Jeff really likes Vegas. Every time I hear him talking about it, he's so excited. And uh, we just ran away to have some fun and got to the sphere for the first time. That was very impressive. Yeah, yeah. I did. And you saw Postcard from Earth, which is what I yeah. saw when I was there. Yeah. I mean. Great Here's show. my question for you, because I didn't think I was going to have to do this, but I had to keep taking my eyes off of the screen and looking down at my feet because I would get almost like a, um, what do they call that when you get like real dizzy? 
vertigo maybe yeah or, yeah. yeah that's how i felt like i felt almost uncomfortable and it took me like only like 15 minutes and i didn't have to do that anymore but it's so immersive you feel like it's you're there. super immersive i mean there was you know a, not giving anything away i think but you know there's certain times where they're they're in like the jungle with these animals and they just appear like in your peripheral vision and you really feel like there's a very large animal you know standing over you looking at you it's, it's really wild do you remember the we... elephant yes gosh <laughs> I mean, the whole thing is what we in the 70s would have called it sense around, right? You know, there's all these experiences that they're adding to just the visual and the audio. It was it was pretty darn cool. Well, shoot. I mean, in the 90s, we're going to laser light shows. (laughs) How low tech is that compared to what is? I mean, so anyway, the elephant in that (laughs) show, anybody who goes to it will know what I'm talking about. It's like you can see every wrinkle in its skin. And. They do something with the sensory so that you, maybe it's like the smell that they bring in. You just feel like you're on the, smell in the vision. savannah. Yeah. There's breezes. There's things they do. Yeah. You do have to sort of anchor yourself in your seat to to not get sort of swept away. It's it's quite, yeah. quite neat. I, I will say, I was telling you earlier, there's one place that I love to go when visiting Vegas. And I didn't get a chance this time, but I just have to tell people about it. The, the Atomic Testing Museum, which is a little bit off strip to the east, a few blocks away, is really cool and historical and interesting and the gift shop is really cool as well <laughs> so, just imagine lots of things with the atomic symbol on them it's it's nice yeah i i mean i'm a vegas fan i think it's it's when people go there the first few times they end up on the strip and they stay on the strip the whole time i love going to the fremont street experience yep to we me did that that's a that's a real blast um they felt like overhead um i don't know some kind of vision thing and there's a lot of concerts going on it's all free and i think that's where a lot of the locals go because when i've talked to locals they're like we don't go to the strip even for the restaurants because even for a weekend you, you leave and you're broke that's and, and you know speaking of personhood you know I, one of the senses i got from the fremont street experience because it's it's dirty and messy and whatever, but it's real. There's like a realness to the people. And I just appreciate that. Yes. Yeah, totally, totally. Um, well, Eve, thank you so much for doing this. Um, really appreciate having you on. I'm going to close out the show now, unless there's anything else that you wanted to throw out there that, that comes to mind. Just thanks for inviting me back. It is always a pleasure. And I'm sending Jeff good vibes his circumstances and everybody who's been affected it's just really terrible yeah good vibes for jeff and i know he'd be upset if i don't get this next part in which is visit the show on uh www.idacpodcast.com or on x or twitter uh at idac podcast if you want to visit our youtube channel and i really would appreciate that go to idacpodcast.tv or go to YouTube and search us up. And you can also find us on Mastodon at IDAC Podcast at InfoSec Exchange and connect to us on LinkedIn. Eve, we'll have all of you, your information in the show notes. I know that you're open to networking with others in our industry. Um, when you go out to our YouTube site, please subscribe, like this video with Eve. Um, and then other people will find it as well. For now, thank you, everyone, and we'll talk to you on the next one. You've been listening to Identity at the Center. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review, and we'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hit the website at identityatthecenter.com. See you next time on Identity at the Center.